roller in here. And I have done that. If you look on some of the pieces up here, there's actually a little roller in here. Dot, 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 dot. So as it rolls on the cam, it eliminates the load so that it makes it go easier, and then that will make it go. Because what can happen if you have too many heavy things in one piece, this piece, for example, the waiting room piece here, has nothing really heavy in it, so it's not a big deal. There's nothing in there that's a heavy load. The little fishing boy has a bunch of weights inside to counterbalance. It's a big deal for him to lift his arm. So he's got a roller to follow the cam so it doesn't bind and makes it easier to turn the crank. What are the rules for that? It's experimentation, gentlemen. I have no hard, fast rule to give you. If something's heavy, you got to build this little little thing. And if I have one, I don't have one. Okay, well here's one that's a follower without a that's going to have a wire in it. You can pass that around. I, I don't have one with wheels. If you come up and look afterwards, you'll see with the ones with the wheels on it. So these followers do a lot because they take all these lateral forces. These pieces up here have a follower on every cam. Okay, again, I lube this. I can lube that in order they slide. The only trick now is you can't have a cam so much that as this drops down to follow the other side of the cam that it actually interferes with this piece up here. Yeah, so you always got to keep in mind the distance you have so that the cam follower doesn't interfere with the shaft, okay? Um... I'm really throwing my stuff around up here now. Counterweights. Let's talk about turning heads, because turning heads is an interesting thing. All these characters in this one turn their head. You see them all spinning back and forth here? And that's pretty easy to accomplish in that I'm going to draw isometric now. We're going to really challenge, challenge my left-handed drawing, my right-handed drawing in a left-handed world here. I'm going to give you an isometric view. There's a cam. Looks like that. And I'm going to put a follower on it. And this follower is going to go down and have its center here, come out like this, go like that. And on the top here, it's going to have a little hole on it. And just so to make sure that you know I'm still doing it nice symmetric, I'm going to go like this, go like that, out like this, out like that. Everybody sort of get the gist of that? Okay, so how this works is this is going to go up and down as it rides around this cam, around this pinion point right here. Right? But as S goes up and down, this is going to go back and forth, right? Right? It's going to go like, like that. Okay? So if I put a wire in here and have it pull something here that looks like this, I will stick a wire in there, and this has a big stick sticking through it, like that, what's going to happen? It's going to turn his head, exactly. And here he is. So here's a very simple body guy, and I can turn his head just like that. All right, and again, if I put some wax in the bottom of that, wax in the bottom of that, he's going to go back and forth all day long. Is he? No, he's not. Because when it pulls him, right, he's going to turn and be pulled. But what's going to make this cam fall back down again? If this cam turns, ri if this cam turns around to its lower, What's going to make this fall back down again? Weight. Okay, it's got to have a weight on it. So if, if it stopped there, it wouldn't happen. He'd go there. This thing would hang up in space and would never turn again. So that's why you see this piece on here. And in fact, if you come up to the front and look at some of the work up here, you'll see that sometimes I cut natural weights in here like this. I extend the follower and this is actually only there for counterweight so it actually pulls the head back the other direction okay and in some cases the pieces are so big and heavy that that's not enough and I actually drill a hole in there and I hang a little weight on it and you can see that right here this guy this black thing is in fact just doing that its old job is to make sure when the cam f goes down, that the counter, that right now, it's going to go down. It's only going down because this is pulling it back down. If I held it up, it wouldn't go. If I didn't have the counterweight on there, it wouldn't go spin back around. Now, sometimes those, I try to build those out of a hardwood or something heavy, but it isn't enough. So I actually cut the bottom off it. I drill out a quarter-inch hole. I stick a piece of a broken bolt in or fill it up with solder, glue the wood back in the bottom of it, paint it black, and nobody knows there's a lead weight in there. But it may be necessary to do that depending on how stiff 
the piece is to make it to make it work. So that's the first rule: is it's hard to make a spinning head without doing that. Yeah. I try to avoid using springs. I have yet to use the spring. I try not to do it. Lots of guys do with very good effect. Um, I may get to the point where I do, but right now I guess I'm. Uh, imagine me trying to be a purist, right? <laughs> like, a, um, you know. So I haven't I haven't done it. I've thought about it many times because I get frustrated sometimes when there's something I want to do that uh, I'd like to do that's kind of hard to work on. Um, four bar mechanisms are the other uh, the other big chunk of uh, automata. We talk about mechanisms. Cams are the number one thing in terms of making, because you're converting a rotary movement into a vertical movement a lot of time, right? One of the other ways to do it is to make this thing have a string on it. In fact, if you look in the back of the fishing boy here, I won't drop you again. I, on, I try, I promise. There's a wire on this one right here. If you look down here, if we can zoom in here, I'll turn it this way. See this little wire here? If I turn this crank, I'm going to go to the other side for just a second here so I can turn the handle for you. Okay, so we're going to look right in there. See the wire there? We go around there enough times. There's a, a Geneva mechanism on this thing that makes that wheel turn only every once in a while. And I'm trying to look down through the crack in the dock so I can see it start to turn, but I'm wiggling around. It's wiggling, okay? So... It actually pulls that lever. It's up against the pin now. See that pin coming down there? This time, that pin's going to keep that lever from moving, from coming up. Okay, so it's, see it's trying to pull, then it's, it stops. So you can use a, a cable. Now, I use stainless steel braided wire for that because it's something I want to last. I buy that at a craft shop. I know you guys all have wives that are big into beading. If you want really fine stainless steel braided wire in a plastic sheath, you go to, uh, again, I keep wanting to say Lewis Craft. Uh, go to Michael's, and you can go to their beading section and buy stainless steel wire and get the little crimps and put it together. So that's what that is. That whole crimping wire mechanism is, is to make this little four-bar mechanism in their work, and that's what makes the green fish go out in and out in the front. So it just pulls the four-bar mechanism, which is a common, common thing. The... Um, there's a website or a book called 507 Mechanisms that was written in 1800 and something or other. And it's available on the website for free. You can go to the website and see animated versions of these mechanisms. So if there's something you think you want to try to build and you want to think of a mechanism to do it, I recommend you go to this 507 Mechanical Mechanisms. And there's something in there that's going to do your pistol. Now, there's some pretty weird stuff in there from back in the days when they're making steam engine gears that go funny directions and all those kinds of things, but there's some good ideas on that. Yeah? Yeah, I use brass. Uh, brass rods are the other key ingredient that I use in all my pieces. When I'm building this, I would put a 1 16th inch brass pin through here. So how I, how I actually cut this, I'll draw it upside down. So I'm going to draw a profile like that. And this is going to be, what I would do is I would, I would make this thing. I'm really not doing a great job of this drawing. So what I would do is I would cut this as a round. And then after I cut this, I take a handsaw and I actually cut two verticals down inside there, the gap that I want it to be. Then I take my little Dremel tool and I chew out the wood to the best ability I have. And then I put a wheel inside there. Of course, the wheel's got to be small enough that it doesn't hit there. I've drawn this the wrong size, right? right. I push a 1 16th rod through here. So this hole is 1 16th, tight fit. The hole in here is 1 32nd bigger than 1 16th, so it'll rotate. And then to make sure that pin stays in there, most time it's a pretty tight fit. I put a little drop of CA glue on there, and that'll grab the brass enough that it won't uh, go out and that this thing will spin. If, it, if you don't make it 1 16th bigger, then you're, you're knackered. And that's true for a lot of stuff I do. If you talk about this little guy's head, this is a quarter-inch dowel. Remember I told you quarter-inch dowels aren't round? This is a Lee Valley quarter-inch dowel. It would stick and be terrible in that hole. That hole is 17 64ths, and that's what allows this thing to fall from its own gravity. In some cases, if a dowel is bent a little bit, I actually make that hole just a little bit bigger because all the hole's trying to do is keep it in the right place. And this length of thing is not too severe. It's not going to bend a lot. And the weight of the head isn't very much. If it was doing something more sophisticated, I'd have to be more careful about that. Okay? 
Uh, how are we doing for time? Damn, okay. Let me just finish up by talking about two things. One is the assembly, because that's, that's where the scary nerve comes. I told you I put all the stuff together in here. I, I take the main shaft apart. If you go on my website, you can see pictures of this cam shaft. There's 17 cams on that piece. And they're all lined up, and I've got a coffee on the bench, and I'm shaking like crazy because now is the moment of truth. So I start in the middle, and I put the first cam on. And I use a very thick set CA glue, so a gap filler, because sometimes there's a little bit of space. Remember I told you the dowels aren't necessarily wrong, this da long, round. This dowel is longer than a foot, so it's not Lee Valley special, right? So I put one side, fill it with CA glue, let that set. Then I flip it on the other side, and I get a weaker CA glue to penetrate the gap from the other side. And so I kind of bind and almost socket weld it on with CA glue. Now, I did that because if, you, if I use the uh, PVA glues, the, you know what? I've had them fail on me in the past, and there's nothing chews you off more than having a cam in the middle of a long string come off because now you're, how do I fix it? Because it's got the residue from the other glue in there. It's sometimes you have to try and drill a hole right through all the length of the cam into the middle, put a pin in to keep it from rotating. So I use CA glue, but when you use CA glue, there's no going back. If you have a problem with that, it's a cut. You can drill it out. Like I've, I've taken a shaft apart before, sliced it up, and drilled all the 3 8 dowels I glued in again and reassembled it. You can do that because CA glue is a little forgiving that way. It'll break where it, 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 it would happen. But you just keep going. You put one on, put the next one. Put it in, put the, put the follower in, make sure it's the right place, mark it with a pencil, check it three times. Again, start from the other side, go. And then once you start putting them close together, it's hard to get the CA glue down in between them. You can do the front side as you go, but not the back side. And never, gentlemen, never ever use CA glue out of the bottle because you know someone's going to open the door and you're going to be scared and squeeze all the CA glue out at the wrong moment in time and glue the whole thing together. So, you know, d put on a wooden stick or a piece of brass rod and dab it in there. Uh, and it's a very painstaking and trying to drive. It usually takes me some courage. I take about two days to think, okay, am I really ready to do this? And I go out and focus myself and I, and I, I do the thing. Then put it all together. Again, if you go to the, my website, again, I'm not telling the website there's nothing for sale on there, but you can see a video of the mecha this mechanism that the top works on, and you can see it running. When I'm building it, I'll stick my variable speed drill on the end of it and let it rip just to make sure the gearbox is running smooth and all that stuff's good before I put it on. So you can spin it pretty hard, uh, and it's pretty good. Tools. Last subject I'll talk to. Everybody says, well, how do you do this? I have in my shop a bandsaw a 15 inch general which is just as great as what you got back there I use it for roughing out stuff I don't do that much finish cutting with it because I love to put a very fine blade on my scroll saw uh, which I have the same model as you guys have here and if you're really good with it you don't need to sand those surfaces if you're good those gear teeth I do not sand those surfaces unless I've made a cutting error and the cam surfaces again you use a double a, a size one blade or a double lot blade they're like silk when you get that done as long as you got a steady hand now I don't have a lathe so how do I make circles? I make them like all you guys do. I cut the circle out with a 1 16th bigger than the paper template, and I go to my disc sander, and I sand it the line. Very seldom do what I do have an outside diameter that really matters. I mean, a cam, yeah, I might sand a cam a little bit, but you know what? It's not, it's not the world to end if it's not perfect smooth because usually something's moving anyways. So I don't have a lathe, which means I buy the knobs for the handles. I buy that just because it's nice to feel and nice to turn. I go to Lee Valley and I buy their inner old, uh, their inner old knobs. But all the rest of this, all the sanding that's done for these little knobs and washers and all that, I do it by hand on a sander. So if you've got a desktop sander, you got a drill press, which is instrumental in drilling clean holes, a scroll saw. What else do I have? Band saw that helps to rough it out but my my scroll saw I cut up the three quarter inch stuff on my scroll saw in fact if I'm working in basswood the head blocks for these things I'll even cut up the inch and a half on my scroll saw with a number nine blade in it uh, I might scream a little bit going across the grain but it's uh, actually not too bad and uh, then the last part of it is uh, I use um, a Dremel tool when we I do some power carving as opposed to wheeling I use a lot of carving knives as well to shape when I get into doing bodies and arms and things like that. I use a combination of, uh, to get started, I'll use a Dremel tool with one of those titanium blades on it. Those suckers can eat wood like crazy. I don't know whether you guys, anybody here uses those suckers. You got to be careful with that because that'll just go through anything like crazy. And then uh, I use that uh, for finishing. I use sandpaper, the, the um, open weave sandpaper. 
uh, which I find is great. It doesn't bind the sawdust goes through it. Uh, it's really good stuff. I have a, I had a piece of it kicking around in the box here somewhere. Actually, I think uh, you can you can't get it at Lee Valley. It's I think it comes from the automotive industry. It's like drywall sandpaper, but it's a little more aggressive. It, Abernate, yeah. It's in disc, yeah. It would charge because my club my club got together and they bought big rolls of it. and They said, okay, how many feet of 120 do you want to buy? How many feet of 240 do you want to buy? How many feet of 400 do you want to buy? Because they use it for doing the bird finishing up to 800. Uh, it's a great polishing uh, kind of tool. So I don't know that I've got any other, re other thing to say to you guys other than I'd love to for you to all take up a project at some point in Automata because uh, there's not too many of us around and I have no, very few people to talk to. So it'd be great to get a bunch of people interested. <laughs> and uh, I, have a I have a blog. I don't have a... I don't have a forum on my website where it would start conversations. I haven't found that many people that interested, but I have a blog, and uh, I try to update a couple times a week what I've been up to and just show pictures of what I'm working on. So, I used to do whirly gigs. Um, my trouble is is that these do not stand well outside. So unless you're going to bring it in all the time, out of the, if a rainstorm comes along, like if it's raining tonight when I'm in the car, like I got my umbrella up and I'm huddling, because if this gets water-soaked... It's game over, right? And in fact, uh, there's a difference between having these in the city and having them at the lake, because I'm right beside a lake, and they actually behave differently. So as I'm getting smarter, I've known that you've got to leave it more, more tolerance for the humidity. Question in the back. You mentioned you made your discs on the disc standard. Yep. Now I assume that you, at one point you wanted for the dollar in the center. Yep. How do you find the center exactly? Just like I did that gear, I would actually go to my CAD drawing system. And I, I know not everybody does CAD. I draw a circle, and I don't care whether you do it on AutoCAD pages or uh, WordPerfect now. You can actually draw a circle and then draw a small circle inside, put a crosshair in the middle of it, and I would print that out, glue it on, and I'd use that. I'd, I'd drill a hole, and then I'd, I'd go to the outside line. So I'd, when I'm cutting a disc that big or sanding a disc like that, I locate it with a drawing, with a piece of paper on a stick -em. Yeah, there is no, hey, there's lots of stuff on the internet about how do you find the center of a dowel, because that's a problem I get into sometimes. Find the center of a one-inch dowel. Most of the time, I'll put the dowel on my table saw or flat surface, take a block of wood, maybe a half inch or something, draw a line, rotate the dowel, draw a line, rotate the dowel, draw a line, rotate the dowel, draw a line, and sooner or later, you're going to get the center close enough to a center that maybe you can put a, a thing on I always find that unless you're drilling a short length of dowel, when you go to drill the end of the dowel, it's damn hard to keep the drill from going cockeyed anyways. So it's a, it's a challenge. I, I try to avoid drilling long dowels. The only thing I will tell you, because people always want to know this one, and I'm, I'm, I'm now talking too much, this dowel has a quarter inch or a one-eighth inch slot cut in it. That's a finger loser if I ever saw one, right? I used to do these on my 10-inch table saw. Uh, I have... Yeah, under a block, under a block, okay? So I'd, I'd cut a quarter-inch rabbit in, I'd put this in, and I'd still want to jump out the back. You, gotta be, you know, I used to have to put something behind them. I have a three-inch table saw. It was a, from Proxon. Proxon makes a lot of very small woodworking tools. I have a half-inch sander. I have a three-inch table saw. It's a lot safer to do that with this. I still use a block and clamp it underneath. But this is where the wire goes in to make the eyes go up and down inside here. Is what, and this is what the head sits on to go back and forth like that. Okay? Any more questions, gentlemen? I've used up my time. You You're welcome. Oh, thank you very much. And... and I've always looked at these enviously. Well, now I now I can say I have one. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, he's fine. He's fine. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's fine. No, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs>